volunteering in the community also helps with your career development. But the other survey that we did was what were people's challenges when they were looking for a job? You know, obviously people, I'll see the, the posts all the time, I can't find a job. I've been unemployed for six months. And I'm like, wait a minute. It's not that hard. Let's see what's out there in the community. So one of the first things that we saw, technical difficulty, one of the first things that we saw in the community were that more than 45% of the people in the community didn't know how to find a job. I think this is an underrepresentation given how many tweets I see out there and how many angst messages I see on Slack and social media that, you know, the stupid recruiter won't get back to me or, you know, someone, you know, I got lost in a black hole or, you know, I can't find a job. I'm like, all right, you might not be using the right tools. So we also asked what were some of the top ways that people were looking for a job. And it was great to see that, you know, a lot of people asked their friends. Because when you look at studies that come from companies as far as how they find people, it is always through referral. Referral is the number one way that you're going to find a job. But that relies on your network. And if your network is only 10 people, and those same 10 people keep referring you to certain jobs, guess whose problem that is? That's your problem because you're not getting the number of referrals that you need. So you need to constantly be going out there and looking for new network connections to be able to help your you know, job search. The other was people always went to the companies that they know. And that's interesting because uh, I was talking to some of the people in the community earlier and they're like, well, I keep applying to this one company and they, they just never respond to me. And I was like, okay, that is sort of, you know, the definition of insanity. You keep going after the same thing time and time again and expecting a different result. You might want to expand to the number of companies that you're going to re you know, research and connect with, like going and talking to each one of the sponsors here. You may not like the company, you may not know what they're all about, you may not like the government agency that's there, but give them a chance, talk to them. Because one of the things that happens is recruiters do network with other recruiters. And if you have a network of recruiters, they may not have something for you, but they can definitely push you and connect you with other recruiters who might have the job that you're looking for. The other which is interesting is search online postings. But what I find fascinating is that a lot of people just stop at one job board or one job site, maybe Indeed or something like that. But you have to remember that companies are paying for those job postings. So they're not going to post on every single job board because it costs anywhere between three and $400 per job posting to post on a job board. So when you're looking at job postings, you're going to have to expand to the number of places that you're going to be searching for, not just one place. Because I, it's interesting when people talk to me and they say, well, yeah, I looked at that one job board. And I say, you do know that there's several hundred of them out there. You might want to look at a few others. Do any of these strategies sound familiar to you? Is anyone using all of them or just one of them? How many are using all of them? Okay, which one do you find to be the most successful for you? Shout out. Referrals. Referrals. Okay, great. Awesome. So what's interesting is that, yes, networking is definitely one of the top ways that, you know, people are looking for a job. I also found it interesting that a lot of people were using social media. But when you look at data coming from recruiting marketing or from any of the recruiting sites, they will tell you that they have a very, very small percentage of their referrals coming through social media. So the community is primarily using social media, but the recruiters are not. Now, believe me, I am going out and telling my customers, definitely use social media more. But you have to remember, if you're relying on social media to say, hey, I'm looking for a job, it's not going to hit a large percentage of people who are doing the hiring. It will hit people who may be able to refer you, but it's not connecting you with the recruiters that can offer you a job. Referrals, I found interesting that, you know, they were sort of down there low at 60%. Now, does everyone understand employee referral programs? Okay. Really? No? Okay. We've got one side of the room saying yes, the other side of the room is saying no. That's great. So, referrals. 
Does anyone know what the referral is for a full scope poly reverse engineer in San Antonio? More than 20 grand. Okay. So what's interesting is people are like, my God, why are companies spending so much money? You know, we're all like, wow, that's a waste of money. Okay. Hold on. So employee referrals are, you have been referred into a company by someone who works at that company. And what's interesting is that one of the biggest differences as to why people don't work at a specific company is what reason? Culture. There's not a good culture fit. So if you go into a company and you're not a good culture fit, you're going to be unhappy and the company is going to be happy. But if you're referred in by an employee, they know that you're going to fit within the culture. Then they're also going to know that you have the skills that you say that you're going to have. So they have already identified the fact that you're technically able and that you're also going to fit within the uh, culture of the company. So then what they're going to be able to do is refer you in. You will jump ahead of the line of absolutely everyone who has applied for that job and you will get through the hiring process much faster. But this then goes back to your network. How big is your network so that you can be referred in to somebody? And the reason why that bonus is so high is because when you think about it, someone who is not on the recruiting or HR payroll has done the verification. Someone who is in another cost center has done the verification that you're a right fit and that you have the technology. So you have actually saved them not having to post a job, not having to pay a recruiter's salary, not having to go through all of the hiring steps by having that person referred in. So it is more efficient and more cost effective to have an employee referral program. And then job boards. What's interesting is that, as I said, many of the recruiting studies that are out there for the last 10 to 12 years, the number one way that companies hire is through employee referrals. Number two is job boards. So yes, they may have been around since 1994. They are still a place that you're going to want to go and do your ground intel, find out who's hiring, what they're hiring for, but also creating profiles on different job boards so that you can expand your network to other recruiters who are doing specific uh, job boards. So we also asked some of the areas where there were trouble, you know, understanding the job search process. And what's interesting is there is not a lot of sort of explanation about where people have specific skills and which companies are hiring from them. And I think one of the reasons for this is that we call different things different things. So it's really on the onus on the job seeker to do a little bit more diving deeper into all of the job postings and sort of trying to find like the flag in the job posting to see if maybe that job posting has some of the skills that you're looking for. And I am just going to apologize for every single uh, security services company that's out there that the job postings are awful. They are. And I, I wish I could change it, but I can tell you it is not just in this industry. It is in absolutely every industry. We try very hard in our company to talk to the recruiters and explain to them to change their job postings. Some of them will accept it. Some of them won't. Don't get mad at the company because they have a really shitty, oops, I did it again, uh, that they have a really bad job posting. You know, sometimes it's an HR department that is not only hiring for the admin, they're also hiring for a pen tester. And they have absolutely no idea what a pen tester does. They just take whatever is thrown at them, put it in a job posting, make sure that it, you know, complies with EEOC, and then post it, and then try to do the screening. This is an opportunity for you to do reverse education. This is the time to sort of take a breath. Look at the job posting when you're on when you're on the telephone interview. Don't grill the person. Have a conversation. 
Do they truly understand what this job posting is about? And what's great is if you have a really good conversation with that person, that person is your ambassador inside the company. They are going to be your advocate because most recruiters are going to be your advocate to get inside the company. And they're going to say, not only does this person have the technical skills, but they also related to me as a person. They actually helped me. And I think that this person is going to be able to help us in our company and really get us moving forward. This, the determining the next step in the career, this is, this is across the board in our community. I can't tell you how many times, I was at Circle City last weekend doing resume reviews and people were sitting down and they had, you know, 10, 12 years experience in a specific regulated industry and they decided to, they wanted to jump out of it and move someplace else. And I was like, Time out. You've worked with financial regulations or healthcare regulations or gaming regulations for the last 12 years, and you think that you need to go do something else more technically challenge, challenging? Do you know what it's like to have experience in a regulated industry and in security? That's gold mine. So, you know, really understand, do the research, go to several of the resources that are online to decide what the next path is for you. Don't be like what it was reported in the Department of Labor Statistics, which is pretty much anyone in information security or information technology changes jobs every 13 months. We are a revolving door in most companies because we get burned out and we don't understand what our next step is. Your job is to decide what your next step is in your job. That is not the job of the recruiter. That is not the job of a resume reviewer. That is your job. If you need some resources, there's CyberSeek dot org, which is part of the, the NIST standards that sort of does career pathing. There are plenty of articles out there on how to devise, you know, your next career step. You have many great mentors here in the room, like Nicole, who can sort of talk that through with you. But at the end of the day, that is your responsibility. It is not a company that's going to post out something like a McDonald's menu and say, okay, how do you want to get to the Big Mac? You know, that, you know, you have to worry that. I figured that out all myself without any coffee. Hey, the big one is finding the recruiters to work with. And what I find interesting is that everyone puts all recruiters into one lump place. They're all bad. Ugh, no, that is like saying all hackers are bad, okay? They're not. So we have to understand that there are different kinds of recruiters out there. There are different kinds of staffing firms. There are different kinds of headhunters. So you have to understand that there, does everyone understand the difference between a staffing firm, a headhunter, and a direct recruiter? Okay. Only a few yeses over here. So first you have a, an executive headhunter, and I, I might be covering this later in the talk, but it's a good point that needs to be reiterated. Executive headhunters, there are several of them out there. They are hired with a, a fee, a retention fee, to go out and find sort of your executives, your CISOs, your you know CFOs, things like that. And they're the ones that are going to be cultivating you for several years. You also have staffing firms. There are some really great ones in our community and there's some really bad ones. And you just have to understand what they're motivated by. They're motivated by their funds, by the fee that they get by placing you as a butt in a seat. They are the ones that are going to say, have I got a job for you? And they're going to say they pulled, you know, CISSP out of your LinkedIn and they keep spamming you. Their job is to get somebody in that seat for their company, for their customer, and hope that you stay in there for more than six months because after six months they then get your fee, get their fee, which is usually between 20 and 30 percent of your salary. So they are very motivated by money, not by fit. And then you have direct recruiters. Direct recruiters are the people who actually sit in the company, who actually work for the company, and actually know what's going on with the company as far as, you know, if they're hiring up, if they're changing job, if they're changing contracts. Those are the people that you really want to establish a connection with. Because recruiters, their job is to make sure that you fit within the team. They want to make sure that they're not having to hire for your position again in six to eight months. They want to make sure that you're there for the long term. They're also, as I said, your advocate within the company. 
So anytime you have a telephone interview or you're at a career event and you have a really great conversation with a recruiter, do me a favor, connect with them on LinkedIn or on social media and keep up to date with them. Because what's interesting is that we have these networks of people that help us with, you know, lock picking or that they help us find a really great vacation spot or a restaurant. But when we have a career and we're looking for a job, we don't have a network of recruiters who can help us as well. Because as I said, recruiters also connect with other recruiters. And if they have a job, if they have a candidate that they can't put in a job, they'll definitely share it within their networks. I'm part of many groups on uh, social media and they'll say, hey, I have this really great uh, candidate. We just can't find a really good fit for him. Highly recommend him or her. Could you know someone want to talk to them? So definitely be sure that you have a network of five to six, maybe even 10 recruiters that you touch base with on a regular basis. Every six months, send yourself a calendar notice and say, it's time to connect with that recruiter again. Just send them a message. Hey, you know, I'm getting my next certif certification. I just did this great big project. Would love to just keep in touch with you. And they'll say, hey, great. That's, that's wonderful. That is how you can make sure that if you all of a sudden get that wonderful pink notice or you decide that you're no longer happy at your job, please don't flame out on a job. But if you decide that you want to start looking at other opportunities sort of in a quiet way, you can send a message to this group of recruiters and really really sort of get their feedback. What's the community like? What's the industry like? What's the going rate? All questions that you're dying to ask and you now have your recruiter group that can help you on that. So do you have the right tools? It's interesting that a lot of people don't sort of package themselves as far as being out on a job search. They just think that their persona is enough. I'm sorry, it's not, because your persona is not going to go through the applicant tracking system, which is what you're going to be submitting to when you submit your resume. Okay, anyone know what an ATS is? Well, she's here to heckle me, so anyway. <laughs> ATS is AKA the black hole. So the applicant tracking system is the place where when you submit your resume, your resume is going to go in and it's first going to be read by a computer. So everyone, when I was looking at the resumes last week at Circle City, a lot of people had these really fancy resumes that had grids and graphics and they had bold and italics. Okay, if you don't know what the user interface is on the computer that's reading your resume, what is it going to do to all of those graphics and those grids? It's gone. And you know what the recruiter's going to do? Oh, another gobbledygook. Boom. You've just ended up in the black hole because you wanted to make a resume look pretty because your buds had said, hey, isn't this look nice? Sorry. You don't know what the computer is on the other end that's going to be reading your resume. Plain, simple, black, white, no bold, no nothing. And please, you don't need to share your address. I couldn't believe how many uh, resumes I saw last week that had your physical address. We're in security. Why would you be giving your physical address to a bunch of people that you don't even know, OK? So your email address and your phone number, please. They just need to know how to get in touch with you. The top two inches, location, location, location. Most resumes are going to be reviewed by a preview screen. So having all of that information that's bold and pretty and stuff, they're just going to see that. They're not going to see your skills. So please, name, email address, phone number, and then a summary of your skills. Be able to say the top three things that you're really good at, the things that you want to do. And then customize your resume with the next two bullet points that are what's customizable to that specific job that you're applying for. That is what's going to show up in the preview screen, and that is what's going to get you the next step. The other thing is you're going to be talking about yourself in many different ways online. And we all are really horrible at sort of our elevator speech, our promo. We don't want to be seen, you know, salesy and that's slimy. We don't want to do it. You are your advocate. 
you have to be able to talk about yourself. So in addition to your resume, which I know is just a painstaking process that no one likes to do, not even me, you also have to have some content that you talk about yourself. So that if you have an aboutme.com or you have any kind of website that's out there that's talking about yourself, do you have a paragraph that really speaks to who you are? Your skills, what you're good at, and your community involvement. That's what you should have in some kind of ready-made profile information to put out there because you're also going to have that possibly in the application process. You're going to have to write about yourself in a small abstract and say, this is why I'm really great for this company. And do look at your social media. Um, there are many savvy recruiters out there who are scanning the social media out there before they even look at a candidate. I am not an expert in HR law, so I can't tell you if that's legal or not, but I can tell you that they do do that. There are reports out there that say more than 80% of the recruiters who are online who do know social media, they will look at your social media before they contact you for an interview. So if you're someone who has very strong opinions about certain things, you might want to put that more in a private chat rather than all over social media. So we also asked who do the recruit, who do uh, job seekers like to really work with, and I was very you know heartened to see that more people like to work direct with recruiters. I think the challenge is is that we don't have enough networks out there on who the recruiters are. One thing you also have to understand: if a recruiter is at one company, they more than likely are going to be there for a few years, but then they're probably going to move on to someplace else, and that's not a bad thing for you, that's actually a good thing for you because they're moving on to a place with more opportunities. And if you have cultivated them and moved on to a new job, they have moved on to a new job, they may have a whole new wealth of opportunities that they can share with you. And you've done the groundwork, you've kept in touch with them. So as I said, you know, these are the different kinds of recruiters that are out there. The corporate recruiter who is the direct recruiter, the person who works inside, the staffing firm who is sort of their onus is to make sure they get their money because they're all paid on commission. They get maybe a very small flat salary and then the rest of the money that they get to pay their bills comes through their commission. So they want you in the seats. And then the headhunters who are definitely looking for the high end sort of the system and things like that. I really believe that you have to have at least five to seven solid direct recruiters in your network. And these are definitely people that you've talked to, you've met with, and they understand what your skills are and that you feel you can keep up to date with them. I'm really challenged with people say they don't have time for this. That is ridiculous. This is maybe an hour or two a month of networking with people just to make sure that, you know, all of a sudden if you need a job, like I can't tell you how many times people call me and they're like, I need a job yesterday. I'm like, that's not my problem. I'm sorry, it's not. You know, if you decided to flame out on a job and you didn't do the resume building and you didn't build the recruiters, I'm sorry. Go back and do that work and then you can come talk to me. So we also learnt, looked at sort of, you know, what are the certifications and out there, and there are plenty out there. I've, I find it fascinating that we have this conversation in the industry, do you get an education, do you get a BA, a BS, or do you get the certifications? I think you need to have both. That's just my personal opinion. I know a lot of people in the room will have, you know, different opinion. I was actually speaking to some folks last week who actually, they had tuition reimbursement, but they decided not to complete their degree, and I was like, why? You know, you're, you're getting a free degree. Why are you not getting it? I know that a lot of us don't like to go to school. I love going to school, have five degrees, but that's just me and the way I was raised. There are many ways that you can get your uh, BA or your BS online. You can definitely do it for free. Marcus Carey, you know, wonderful guy. He's got some great online resources out there, all free on how to get your degree and how to get certifications. But if you don't have your basic degree, you're sort of limiting yourself 
on opportunities, especially in San Antonio, which is such a government city that most of the government jobs, be them cleared or not, will have the basic requirement of having some kind of degree. So if you're in that position where you don't have a degree, please go ahead, do what you need to do online to get it. And then start doing some of the research as far as what sort of uh, certifications you want to do. The one thing that I love to point out is that this is a, an, a community that loves to learn. And when I talk to a lot of the recruiters they are fine with the fact that you know someone might not have all of the the certifications they might not have all of the technical knowledge but being able to show that you have initiative that you want to learn that you're inquisitive that is really great that is what everyone in this industry really wants they can't teach that they can't teach you to have the thirst for knowledge. And being able to get out there and show that you have that thirst of knowledge is definitely something you want to highlight in any of your outreach to recruiters or any time you're in an interview is really talk about the ways that you go out and you try to you know, go for that, thirst, uh, that knowledge. Realize that, especially in this industry, if you want to get into the cleared community, you are also going to have to go through a whole other level of certifications. Most of those are paid by the government if you work for them, but you know, realize that it is a very certification heavy industry. I wish it wasn't, but it is. There are also many different ways to be able to get the certifications, but you have to realize you know, what you're interested in. I mentioned earlier cyberseek.org. That really gives you a lot of sort of pathways and the certifications that you're looking for. A lot of students will come to me and sort of say, well, I need, you know, I want to get a job, but I need the experience, but I don't have the experience to get the job. So the, the old chicken and the egg program. And yes, a lot of the companies that I talk to, they really say, hey, it's great because we have specific requirements. We, we ask for the certifications. But we really want to know what you do to get out into the community and teach yourself. So if you have a home lab, be sure that you're talking about that in your job search. And if you don't have, you know, if you have your home lab in your head, but you don't have it written down someplace, you might do yourself the favor to sort of like, you know, did you do a Beowulf cl cluster or what did you do or what are the different things that you do with your home lab? Because you're definitely going to want to talk about it in your interviews, both in, ri in written and also verbally. Competitions. Competitions have been around 20, 30 years now, yet a lot of people aren't looking at them as work experience. So what is a competition? You show up someplace, you have a goal, you have a shortage of time, you have a shortage of resources, you're working with people you've never worked with before, and you're working against an adversary you've never worked against before. Does that sound familiar? That's work experience. So be sure that any time that you're part of a competition, after you've completed it, after you've gotten yourself the beer and you high-fived, take about 10 to 15 minutes, sit off in the corner, and write down what happened, what the goal was, what was the infrastructure that you had, what did you fail at and learn, because that's always going to be a question in an interview process. What, what did you fail at and what did you learn? And you really don't want to say, well, I, I failed at work and all the servers went down. You want to say, hey, I failed at, you know, this in this competition and this is what I learned. You also want to, you know, talk about, hey, did you learn any of your non-technical skills? Did you become the leader or the follower? Did someone drop their pack in the middle of the competition? and you had to pick it up and how did you deal with that conflict and that frustration all in that point did you like you know swear a lot or did you like okay I can process through that these are all those non-technical skills that every employer is looking for and you have a 
perfect microcosm to be able to share when you use those specific skills. So really look at doing you know, as competitions as a way to learn skills, but it is also something that you can add to your resume, to your social media profile. Our job board, you actually can list it on your, your profile, the competitions that you're part of. I know a lot of the recruiters out there are being told by their program managers, I want someone who's done a DEF CON CTF, I want someone who's done a wireless CTF. Those are the things that the program managers are starting to look for. I'm looking at other opportunities in different industries because I find it fascinating that we sometimes stay within this swim lane of services and we only jump from services company to services company when in actuality our entire sort of proficiency is something that is used in hospitals and banks and casinos and a variety of different industries. So really looking at can you take your skills and go someplace else. I know, you know, HEB here has, you know, some phenomenal positions that are open. They, I can't say that. <laughs> I would really say look at different industries that you can, if you have a skill set and you think that you can apply it someplace else. I mean, Jack Daniel. Jack Daniel started in security at an automotive group. You know, he was the person who put together sort of the computer and then the computer for two dealerships and then the computers for four dealerships. And lo and behold, he taught himself all of this great stuff and now he's, you know, what, what would you call Jack? Our father? Our dad? Our, our hero? Our dad? Yeah. So, hi, Jack. Um, so really look at other industries because that might open up a whole new level of experiences for you, but also sort of open up a whole new career path. I was really excited when I was talking to someone last week at Circle City Con who had been in the gaming industry for 13 years and he had had some interesting challenges that he had had to overcome. I can't speak about them, but he interfaced with a lot of different people within the community and he was really excited about it and I said then why are you thinking about getting out of the gaming industry when most the, more than half of the states are now legalizing gaming and you have a whole different career path and he had not thought about that so look at other industries show up in the community this is a really big one. As I said, our community is so volunteer driven that those referrals that we're all looking for, those that networking that we're all looking for, the, some of the great ways that you can do that is through volunteering and really looking at the fact that volunteering is getting us out of our swim lane. This is getting us out of our shell. We're all introverts. I'm an introvert. It takes me a lot to get up here, but volunteering in the community is a way for us to get out and connect and start talking to people in the different places that they've worked at and the referrals that they can do. This is amazing opportunities. Management Project management skills, as Nicole said. It's interesting when you're organizing a conference, you know, planning for this conference happened last year at this exact same time when they did a hot wash and they sort of said what went right, what went wrong. We walked around and we sort of said, hey, why are we in three different buildings? Why don't we be in one building? So yay, we're in one building. But it is project management. It's timeline management. These are all business skills that you're going to be able to take to other parts of your career. As I said, competing. Competing is a really great way to be able to say, I have work experience. There are things that I can bring to the table. I may not have the experience that you're looking for in this particular job, but I actually did that same pen testing or that same red teaming when I was part of a competition at DEF CON or you know, even here at B-Sides. Presenting. It is not easy getting up here, I will tell you that. Nicole's gotten up here too. It's not easy. But what's interesting is that presenting 
offers you a variety of opportunities. The first is really getting to know your subject matter very, very well. You can't get up here and talk about a specific topic without being able to poke the holes in your presentation. But two, you also have to know that you want to talk about this six to nine months ahead of time because most of the CFPs that are out there, you know, I mean, we're right now submitting proposals for talks next spring. You have to understand timeline management when you're going to be presenting at a conference. You also have to learn how to write about your, uh, what you're going to talk about. It is not only writing it in a short abstract, it is also in an, a long abstract, it is also an outline, and it is also the key takeaways from the presentation. Does that sound very familiar to a management memo? So that is the exact same thing. If you're looking at going on in your career, you're going to learn, have to learn how to write and how to write to people who don't know all of the technical um, acronyms and background that you have. And you have to convey your ideas. You have to convey this is the security risk. This is the business opportunity or the business risk. And these are the three or four things that I think we need to do to move forward. You also have to be able to understand that we all get rejected. I can tell you you know, of the 10 or 12 proposals that I submit, only about half of them get selected. And that's fine, but dealing with that rejection, dealing with the fact that, hey, I may not have conveyed my idea in the correct way. That is when you go back and you ask for feedback. Most of the conferences, other than the two largest professional conferences that are out there, will give you feedback. And you have to be understanding why, you know, you got that specific feedback. You also have to understand within presenting, who are you representing? Are you representing yourself or are you representing your company? And there are uh, pros and cons for both. There's a lot of discussion right now on Twitter about how a lot of folks are out on the speaking circuit, but they're all paying their own way. And a lot of us do pay our own way. And you have to understand, you know, it's, it's between $500 and $2,000 every time we get out and speak. And there aren't a lot of companies that are paying for that. Well, the reason why they're not paying for that is that the people who are speaking have not done the time management to go to their company and actually go through the approval process. You have to give them time to understand what you're going to be talking about, what the audience is, and how they're going to take care of that in their budget. That might mean that you plan a year in advance that you want to present at DEF CON next year, or that you want to present at B-Side San Antonio next year. You have to have your abstract done now. You have to have the idea done now. You then have to go into your company and say, I have this technical vulnerability that I'm you know, really excited about presenting. It is something that I found on my own time or found out for work. I want to present it at a local technical conference. Will you support me in doing this? Now, they might say no because they don't understand it. And that, again, is where your job is to explain to them, look, we have 700 people who are going to be listening to my presentation. It is part of talking about our identity within the community. It is also part of me helping recruit because I am telling people what a great job it is I have that I'm able to go out into the community. And that person is also going to bring in employee referrals because if someone is up here presenting about their really great idea, everyone in the room is going to get energized and they're going to want to come work at that company. So if you're interested in presenting, really look at it from different perspectives, the business perspective, your career development perspective. A lot of us in the community sometimes don't present under our, our company flag, but you have to decide which one you're going to do. Goes in tight. So it is you know, I've said this over and over and over again in the, pr the presentation, leveraging your community. There's something out there, you know, you're always selling. Remember, you're always networking. And you have to understand your audience. There's a lot of times when I will go Las Vegas, something like that, and people will be having a little bit too good of a time, and they didn't realize who was in the room. And so understand your audiences. Understanding that when you're out in the community, there may be some things that you don't want your future employer to know. So be sure that you're, you're in a great state, not in uh, <clears throat> inebriation or swearing. <laughs> 
Really? Stripping naked on stage will blacklist you from future jobs. So, you know, be careful. Don't do that. Um, we have a lot of fun in our community. And I'm, I'm not saying don't have fun in the community. Just realize that there are going to be instances where doing shots with people may not be, you know, helpful to your career. It's helpful to mine every now and then. But hey. Um, also understand that Getting out face to face as much as possible is really very helpful to again that employee referral, that networking. A lot of us don't like going to new things. That's me. I, you know, I get stage fright. I'm I'm not comfortable in, in new audiences, especially when it's 900 people I've never seen before. But get out there. Try at least one or two new ones a year. I'm not saying one or two new ones a week. One or two new ones a year. This You're always going to have a career. You're always going to be evolving in your career. So you're always going to be wanting to network. So some of the things that you know came out from the survey and just sort of in wrapping up, I just wanted to um, share some of these data just in case you work for a company that might want to see some of this. So we did ask what were some of the things that companies could do to better recruit professionals in the community. And of course, it was no surprise that the number one thing was to provide more remote work. You know, it, is, it has been something that this industry has wanted, or this community has wanted for a very, very long time. And slowly but surely, companies are coming through with more and more remote work. But realize not every company is going to have remote work. You may have to do the working on site for a long time and then build your reputation and then maybe start negotiating with your management like you know hey I've got a hellish commute is there any chance we can you know look at maybe one or two days I work from home or something like that the other thing was making the recruiting program more transparent and this is a challenge not only within this industry but across the board a lot of companies will really uh, lay it out on their career site this is the process that you're going to go through capital one does an excellent job with this so does lockheed martin um, lockheed martin will actually do chats with you so you know if you're checking out their career page and someone will chat with you and sort of describe their process so under understand that that information may be available on the website. If it is not available on the website, that first telephone interview you have with someone, that should be one of your questions. Because remember, you're interviewing them as much as they are interviewing you. You want to ask them, what is the process? What are the different steps that I'm going to go through? You know, When am I going to do the panel interview? When am I going to do the whiteboard? When am I going to have my tech interview? And be sure, if you're doing a tech interview, you. Don't Google everything through the tech interview. You know, if you have to know Linux, if you if you haven't touched it in a while, you might want to go and, and do sort of the the tutorial again um, because we all know when we're you know on a, a phone call and we hear and you're you know you're you're googling the answer. So please don't do that. But definitely one of your questions throughout the entire process is what is the next step? What should I be expecting next? How long is this going to take? Because it's surprising. Sometimes that can take anywhere four to six weeks. I have a, a colleague who went through an 18-month process for a job interview. She finally got it. She actually took another job in the 18 months between it. But there are processes that do take some time. Some of the things that are important to uh, job seekers is definitely the pay, but a close second is work-life balance. So don't be afraid to ask about this in your interview. You've got kids, you've, you know, you've got school situations. What are the work-life balance? We're not all meant to be chipmunks running around or hamsters running around in the, in the wheels. We are meant to also have a life outside of work. So definitely ask for that. And then also, you know, working in a good environment. Um, the stories we hear of people in their work environments is just, it's just appalling. So don't stay there if it's a, a horrible work environment. Your life is way too important. Definitely find some place that has a really good work-life balance. But at the end, it's your responsibility. It is not the recruiter's responsibility. It is not the hiring manager's responsibility what your job is. So a ha moment for me about 
19 years ago was the Dharma questions. And I always get these wrong, so you can, you can read them. What do you do well but hate to do? What do you do well but love to do? What do you not do well but love to do? And what do you, do not, what do you not do well and not love to do? It's interesting. We sometimes have something that we're really, really good at, but we hate it. But everyone identifies us with that particular thing. For me, events. Everyone thought I was the event person. And I don't like doing events. It stresses me out. I, I get back pain. I get migraines. I get all of it. But I do them really well. My first job at World Wildlife Fund, they just handed me six notebooks on events, and I just threw them in the trash, and I said, I'm not here to do events. We've got to rework this. So realize those questions for yourself. And then once you do that, understand that your career is your responsibility. It is not mine. It is not anyone else in the room. You have to do the work, and that's the hard part. You have to do the work so that you are not challenged by your job search. If you would like to share this information with anyone, if you would like to share it with your boss for, you know, or somebody, we do have them on our slide share page. So we have uh, the job search and recruiting, and then we also have the community volunteering survey as well. Really great data there if you need to go to your boss and say, look, this is what the community says. Thank you. Any questions? Any, any questions before we get ready for our recruiter panel? Okay, well, we have Bill Brandstetter, who will start at 10 o'clock doing resume reviews.